All right, so this is Dr. David Spock. You all uh, sort of met him on the panels. You've seen him in the workshops. Um, David is, is one of the best educators I know. He's at the University of Washington. He runs um, an incredible website on HIV that does basics. He's been doing teleeducation for quite a while and very effectively throughout the Northwest and up into Alaska and other places. Um, and he does a great job of uh, over, overview of what we do in primary care and in the basics of uh, especially vaccination. So that's what he's gonna talk to us about today, that confusing sort of realm sometimes of what the uh, ACIP and other things are recommending and he's gonna set us straight. So David, welcome. Mike, thank you. That was a very generous introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus on immunizations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and focus on things that I think maybe you can change in your practice. Many of you know a ton about immunizations, but I'm going to try and hit some things that perhaps maybe you haven't been aware of that are new changes or that are very confusing. I do not have any disclosures. I'm going to make one disclosure. Vaccines do not have generic names, and it's the toughest talk to give in terms of if I start using, you know, five different, you know, letters for all these vaccines, it's very confusing. I don't think we can communicate. So for many of these vaccines, I may use trade name. If I say CPG 1018, some of you are going to go, okay, I know what that is. A lot of you are going to go, wait, what is that? But that's Heplosav B. So I'm going to be trying to use names. I have no vested interest in any of these vaccines or companies, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page so that the effective changes in your practice are, are communicated clearly. So that's my <laughs> disclosure. I apologize for that advance. I hate using trade names, but I will in this particular instance. There are three main objectives. The first is I'm going to try and summarize some new immunization recommendations. Um, I'm going to also try to just briefly point you to a couple of places where you can stay up to date on it. Immunizations to me now seem like antiretroviral therapy was years ago where they're changing all the time. And now antiretroviral therapy, there's not as many changes on a regular basis, but immunizations, if you really look, there's a lot of subtle changes that occur. Um, and then really what I'm gonna hope to do is to provide some up-to-date information about this. So these are the five vaccines I'm gonna focus on. Question and answer, you can ask about other things and hopefully I can answer the question about other vaccines if you have those. But I'm gonna focus on these five vaccines. So the pneumococcal vaccine, the newest conjugate vaccines, the meningococcal vaccines, including older recommendations and not getting confused with the new pentavalent meningococcal vaccine that just got approved several weeks ago. The third, hepatitis B vaccine, which may be the most confusing vaccine that we give in practice, what to do with non-responders and so on. Um, COVID vaccine schedule, which interestingly, looking at the pretest, on the question on this, I think this will be a great thing to review in terms of what are the up-to-date recommendations for COVID vaccine schedules. And then last, MPOX, which there's been a mandate very recently by the CDC that we really should be widely doing MPOX vaccines to prevent a uh, flare in a, another outbreak in the U.S. Okay, so whether or not I'm successful really isn't so much what I can say, it's really whether or not you integrate these changes into your practice. So I think that's really the overarching goal here is that not just to hear what I have to say, but what I'm going to be doing is based on CDC or OI guideline recommendations. So for all of you practicing Ryan White centers, I think these recommendations are not my own. They're, they're from very sound recommendations from, from federal guidelines. Okay, let's start off with the pneumococcal vaccine. I think everybody's aware we've had a lot of changes in pneumococcal vaccines. When I first started doing HIV care, we only had the polysaccharide vaccine, which all of you are probably very familiar with, called the Pneumovax 23. Conceptually, the pneumococcal vaccine is, the polysaccharide vaccine is very straightforward. It's just a piece of the outer polysaccharide. You can take these from as many strains of pneumococcus as you want, very straightforward polysaccharide vaccine. Conceptually, a conjugate vaccine is delivering a package deal to the immune system. You are conjugating this same polysaccharide with a protein that the immune system recognizes and responds very well. 
So as opposed to just presenting the polysaccharide, you're presenting this package to the immune system that really gets a lot more attention. The antigen is digested by MHC cells and macrophage is much better, so you get a much better immune response and much longer lasting immune response and a much more of a T cell related immune response. So the newest vaccines that I'm gonna go over in just a minute are the PCV or conjugate 15 called Vax Nuvance and the PCV 20 or Prevnar 20. And if you watch TV or open magazines, you've probably been flooded with Prevnar 20 uh, advertisements recently it's become very, you know, sort of popular vaccine out for advertising. Now, here's the current recommendation that we all should be up to date on, and that is much simpler than what we've done before. So when I've been practicing HIV, it seems like things always got more complicated. This is one example for all of us. This is great. Things went from really complicated to really simple. So I use this when I think about the conjugate 20, you can be one and done. So anybody that comes in to care, regardless of what their CD4 count is, they've never been vaccinated, one pneumococcal vaccine and they're done. And that's a game changer. We used to have this very complicated schedule that I'll go over in a minute. If you don't have that or you want to use PCV15, you can be one and one. So PCV15 plus the old polysaccharide vaccine. There are no restrictions on the conjugate vaccine for CD4. If you're giving the polysaccharide, the preference is to wait until the CD4 count is above 200. That's the preference. It's not required. There's a slightly higher uh, grading recommendation in the OI guidelines for that. So one and done or one and one now, those are your two options. Much simpler than the schedule that we had before, which I know despite our best efforts in our clinic, we, we just couldn't keep everybody up to date on that old schedule. Here's the question that you all probably know that. So here's the question that's probably more relevant for all of you. Okay, you've got a bunch of people that you've been providing care for years who've gotten some sort of pneumococcal vaccine in the past. What do you do now? That's the question. Is this simple or is this really complicated? Okay, first option you have is the complicated route. You can complete the old schedule. So you can, if they only got pneumococcal 13, you can wait eight weeks, give the polysaccharide, wait five years, give that, wait another five years, and, and then when they're 65, or give that last dose when they're 65. So that's a complicated schedule. That's the one we've had in the past. If you wanna do that, that's fine. What I recommend, and this is in the guidelines now, is that you can basically be one and done now for re-immunization or completing the series. So at any point, you can now give the PCV20 or Prevnar20 and be done with your pneumococcal vaccination. Much simpler for all of our clinics. Makes it from a quality control standpoint dramatically easier. The only place where it's ambiguous is if you look at people who've already turned 65 and they've already done everything, you've gotten everything on board and done it right, do they need another dose? They don't have to have one. It's optional and you can give the conjugate 20. The, the one thing to mention is that if somebody's had a polysaccharide, the recommendation is to wait five years before giving the conjugate. And it's not from a safety standpoint, it's just believe that there's some interference with the immune response. That may be changed at some point down the road, but that's currently what the recommendations are. If they've had polysaccharide, you gotta wait five years, give them the Prevnar 20 and then you're done. Okay, so that's a real nice, Simplification of our clinical practice, it should increase the immunization rates for pneumococcal disease in, in Ryan White clinics. This is really, a, uh, I think, a great thing for us from a primary care standpoint to have such simplified and recommendations. And I have done, been doing HIV for a long time, and I can tell you a lot of people get pneumococcal bacteremia and disease and invasive disease. So this is really, I think, a high priority vaccine. Okay, now let's look at meningococcal vaccines which is a little more, I would say, on the lower end of priority in a lot of clinicians' minds, but let me just bring a couple things newer to your attention. So this was an MMWR that was published this summer by the CDC, and usually for something to rise to the level of reaching the MMWR, there's significant information that's new and important. So there was an increase in meningococcal disease among people with HIV. These, these are over the 2017 to 2022, and you can see the significant increase Albeit these numbers are pretty low, but this is a potentially life-threatening or fatal disease and 100% preventable. If you look at that last year, 2022, basically almost all of these people had not received meningococcal vaccine, the seven that they didn't know about, that, 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 that there were seven that they didn't know about, so essentially probably all of or most of these people had not received meningococcal vaccine. 
Now, there are three different types of meningococcal vaccine. So this is one thing we've gone from simplicity to more complicated over the last 10 years. And let me sort this out for you. The one that you want to be giving in the clinic on a regular basis is this top group, the meningococcal conjugate quadrivalent vaccines. And there's three types. There's, again, these letters are going to drive you crazy, so I'm just going to use the trade names here. There's Minveo, there's MinQuadFi, and then the Minactra, which is what many of you have used for years, has now been discontinued. So not to be confused about that. Minactra is no longer available. There's meningococcal B, which is not routinely recommended for HIV, and there's two of these vaccines, but that's sometimes given to young adults. It's optional, shared decision-making, and so on, but not a routine recommended in HIV. And then there's the newest vaccine, which we don't have any data in HIV that I'm aware of, that has five of the strains, and that's called Primbrea. And that one is just FDA approved within the last six weeks. So I'm going to try to sort this out and make sure that as you walk through this, this is all really clear in your mind what these vaccines are. These are conjugate vaccines just like the pneumococcal vaccine. They're taking a piece of the outer meningococcal uh, that's an outer polysaccharide, and they're basically linking it or joining it, presenting a combo platter to the immune system that is along with the protein. It, specifically, I'm just showing you the protein here. This is a diphtheria protein. This is with a Menveo vaccine. So now the old question I always get asked is, well, why wasn't meningococcal B included? Why didn't we just always have a pentavalent? Well, meningococcal B, that polysaccharide doesn't generate good immunity. It also causes cross-reaction with some neurologic proteins and potential toxicity. So this has never been in the conjugate, the quadrivalent vaccine for that reason. And I'll get to how we got worked around that with the new pentavalent vaccine, how, how the companies did, not me. Okay, so that's what we have in terms of, this is the Minveo. Notice the slight difference here. This is the MinQuadFi. And notice the conjugate protein is the only thing that's different here. So this is now the tetanus toxoid protein that they use as the, 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 the protein that attracts the immune system to come to this. So just a slight difference on that. Same concept exactly. Okay, so here's a question for you. Which one of the following recommended dosing schedules for the quadrivalent conjugate meningococcal vaccine should be used in people with HIV who've never been vaccinated with meningococcal vaccine before? Is it A, give one dose followed by a booster dose in five years, B, give one dose followed by a booster dose every five years. C, give two doses at least six months apart followed by one booster in five years. Or D, give two doses now at least eight weeks apart followed by a booster dose every five years. Okay, that's good. You can show it, I think we got, yep. Thanks for responding, a lot of people responded quickly. Okay, I should advance it, thank you. <laughs> okay, this is what we've got, okay, great. So we've got a little bit of a teaching point. Oh no, this is it, okay, great. So give them two doses, eight weeks apart, follow a booster dose every five years, that's perfect. And that's something to remember later when you're thinking about doing your post-test, so that's great that people have this. Now, this is the recommended dosing schedule, which I think most people are very familiar with. So you've got to do the primary vaccination series, and then the recommendation is every five years following that. And that's been consistent with years. That's the meningococcal quadrivalent vaccine. So not to, to you know, I think to steer off this too much, but I want to bring up one study that I think was overlooked and that I just want to mention, this was in meningococcal vaccine. It was the older meningococcal vaccine, Minactra, and in adolescents and young adults. And if you look at this, this was a response to the vaccine in adolescents and young adults based on CD4 counts, or CD4 percentages. And notice across the, the, the weeks that the serologic response was much better with a higher CD4 count. So personally, since I don't view this as the highest priority vaccine, if I'm thinking about priority, I usually would wait in this vaccine at least until somebody has suppressed uh, viremia that's not in the guidelines and maybe consider waiting till the CD4 is above 200. Again, that's not in the guidelines, but that's just my own personal bias with meningococcal vaccine. The last thing to mention, just to not be um, make this too confusing, but to make sure everybody's familiar with this, is the newest vaccine, which you may get flooded with marketing at some point, 
is a pentavalent, they get around the meningococcal B, instead of using the polysaccharide, they use a protein from the surface of the meningococcal B strain, and they now have this pentavalent vaccine, which has not been studied in HIV, it is not recommended at this point in HIV, is not in any guidelines, so do not suddenly just think you should be replacing our standard quadrivalence with this new pentavalent. I don't see any reason to do that from my standpoint on a routine basis for revaccination. If you had a young adult and you wanted to give this up front, I think that would be very reasonable if you wanted to give them, but for repeat immunizations every five years, this is not your vaccine that's currently recommended to use. Okay, let me shift to hepatitis B. So hepatitis B, to understand the vaccines, you need to understand the structure of hepatitis B. And basically, we're really, with these vaccines, are taking a piece of the surface of the virus, the surface antigen, and putting that in vaccines. There are three major surface antigen proteins, pre-S1, pre-S2, and the S protein. That's relevant when I describe the different vaccines now. Most of our vaccines just have one antigen in it called the S protein or the single uh, antigen vaccines. Okay, there are three different types of hepatitis B. The ones that you've been using for years and years and years is the old single antigen um, hepatitis B, Combivax, and, and Indurex B. These vaccines have one surface antigen and they have an adjuvant, which is different than a conjugate. A conjugate is a combo platter presented to the immune system. An adjuvant is a, a activator that sort of signals the immune system broadly, hey, there's something going on that you should go take a look at, and it activates locally for the immune system to react in a regional fashion, but it is not presenting the antigen and the adjuvant together as a package deal. So a little bit different concept. So those are the, the older traditional vaccines. Then there's the newer Heplosav B, which has a fascinating adjuvant called the CPG-1018. This adjuvant actually binds to the surface of cells. It's a little strip of, of, of DNA, and it activates toll-like receptors, which basically just generally activates and turns on the immune system. The newest of these vaccines is to not be confused um, is something called prehebrio, which actually has all three of the hepatitis surface antigens in it. So it's called the triple antigen vaccine, and it is not currently being recommended for HIV. It is not in any guidelines. So just the key thing is not to get confused with the prehebrio and heplosav B. One is an adjuvant that makes it really strong. The other is the triple, the triple strains that supposedly give you a little bit broader immunity. So different conceptual approach to the vaccinations. Okay, so here's a question. For initial immunization with HIV, which one of the following Hep B vaccine schedules has the highest, most preferred rating in the guidelines? A, three doses of standard dose Indurex B, two doses of standard dose Heplosav B, or four doses of double dose Recombivax B vaccine? Okay, great, thanks for answering so quickly. Okay, great, so this is great. So two doses of the standard dose Heplosav vaccine is now in the guidelines as a new recommendation. So let me just run through this very briefly. Here's currently the three A2 recommendations for providing hepatitis B vaccine. You can either give the double dose of Indurex B, double dose of Recombivax, or standard dose of Heplosav B. Heplosav B is only two doses a month apart. All of those are now considered acceptable in the guidelines. This was just updated in September. Okay, the one point I wanna make, which I think is actually, was not caught in the guidelines, is Twinrix is also listed in the guidelines as an A2 recommendation. If you carefully look at this, Twinrix has only 20 micrograms of the hepatitis B surface antigen Indurex B in it. So if you give Twinrex, you are not giving double dose Indurex B. So you can't have it kind of both ways in this setting. So I personally do not think Twinrex, if you are following the other part of these guidelines, should be considered a A2 recommendation. So I personally would not do that. Um, and, and, and again, I think this is just inadvertent, that this uh, slight dosing issue with Twinrex. Okay, now, why is the, you know, the question is, why is this moved up to a very high level in the guidelines? 
So here's the study that I think all of you should be aware of, and many, probably most of you are, called the Beehive Study. And I'm going to focus on what's been published in the Beehive Study, the second arm. The first arm, which is a non-responder, will probably be finished in June of 2024. So these were people with HIV um, who had a CD4 count of at least 100, well-controlled virus, and, and they had to, in the A arm, they were non-responders, but we're just going to focus on the naive treatment. So people who've never been vaccinated for hepatitis B. What did we see from the hapless AVB? Some people criticized this and said, well, wait, why did they do a three-dose series and it's, we only need two doses? Well, I will really, I think, argue that we get all the information from this up to week or at week 24, even before that third dose is given. So I think even though the study was designed this way, I think we get all the information we need. Here's the serologic responses, which I think are the best we've ever seen in any kind of vaccine study with hepatitis B. So if you look at week 24, essentially when they came in to get their third dose, 99%, 98% of people had a serologic response Zero protective response um, greater than 10. You know, if they got that third dose, then their vaccine, their antibody titers are sky high. This is the best vaccine response that I have ever seen from any studies. And I think from my mind, it convinced me that this is now my preferred vaccine to give to people for HIV who need hepatitis B immunization. And this is a specific study, again, for people with HIV. So what do you do if a person with HIV does not respond to the Recombivax or Endurex B, sort of historically, um, we don't have enough data with non-responses to Heplosab B, and there's probably not going to be a lot of them. Okay, so what do you do if they don't respond? You can do the same thing over again, which is give a double dose of Endurex B or Recombivax, three doses, this is what's in the guidelines, or you could turn to Heplosab B in this point. Um, in our clinic, what I've usually been recommending is if somebody doesn't respond, I have not seen a lot of success with doing the same thing over again, unless maybe they had a really low CD4 count when you started. So personally, what I've been doing in these non-responders is to go ahead and give them Heplosab B as the, as the um, non-responders. Okay, here's what's going to hopefully be again available in June 24, and that's really good data that we should get from, from the um, Beehive study for the non-responders, but that has not been finished and is not out yet. Okay, now let me go over a little bit with the COVID vaccine schedule. And this is something that I think really important. We're all inundated, sick of COVID. We don't, but you know, the reality is we still gotta provide this vaccine to people who are interested and who are willing to take it. And so it's important that I think we do it right. Um, and so I wanna just go over briefly what, what the nuts and bolts of this are in terms of how to administer. What we have now are three options in the US. We have on the left the Moderna spike vax. Um, these are all XBB 1.5 variants. That's what's in all three of these. So this is an mRNA vaccine, as everybody knows. We have the Pfizer community, which is also an mRNA vaccine. And then the newest one is the Novavax, which is important to know about. If you have people that come in your clinic who have not bought into the mRNA and they're worried about it, Bill Gates putting it into their, you know, whatever, that, and they're really worried about the technology, then this is a protein adjuvant traditional vaccine. So it is a really nice option to know that you can provide to people who really don't want to get an mRNA vaccine. Okay, so what do we do? Well, the first thing to sort out is, is your patient in the group of moderately or severely immunocompromised? Yes or no? So the question is for HIV, how do we figure that out? Um, and that's the first thing, and then the second thing you need to figure out is have they previously been vaccinated? And you really need to think about those two things before you decide how many doses, what doses you're gonna give and how far apart. So bottom line is moderately or severely immunopressed, immunosuppressed, and have they been vaccinated before? Here's the key take home point for everybody in the room for HIV. People who fall into the moderate or severely immune compromised conditions are people with advanced HIV. So that can be any of the following, mostly CD4 count less than 200, an age-defining illness where they haven't had reconstitution yet, or clinical manifestations of symptomatic HIV. Also, somebody who has untreated. That's very important because if you have somebody newly diagnosed who comes in who wants to get a COVID vaccine, they fall, if, even if their CD4 counts 400, they fall into the untreated at that point. Okay, so that's the key thing for HIV in terms of the moderately and severely immune compromised. Okay, so let's take the scenario most straightforward. 
pretty healthy, not moderately or severely immunocompromised, never gotten COVID vaccine before, but now wants to get it. So what do you do? Three options, one dose of the Moderna, one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, or two doses of the Novavax given at least three weeks apart. So really kind of easy if somebody is not moderately immune. That's the take home point. If you have somebody not moderately or severely immune compromised, this is really easy. Okay, let's say they've been vaccinated before, even easier. Now you don't even need to worry about giving two shots to the Novavax, just give them one of any of these. So not moderately or severely, you're basically giving them one shot all the time, possibly two if they've never, of the Novavax if they've never been vaccinated. Very straightforward. Okay, now here's where it's complicated. This is important to remember, very important to remember. Um, what about somebody who's not been vaccinated before, but now they're moderately or severely immunocompromised? This is more complicated, and this surprised me when I saw this. So actually, the formal CDC recommendations say, if you're giving them an mRNA vaccine, Moderna or Pfizer, they get three doses up front, three doses. If they're getting Novavax, they get two. Okay, now how far apart do you give these? So it's actually basically about four weeks apart. So the Moderna is four weeks apart across the board, the Pfizer three weeks and then four weeks, but basically, Easier thing to remember is basically wait about four weeks between each vaccine. And the Novavax, three weeks is with that. You have to wait at least that. So this is a little more complicated in the, in the unvaccinated individuals. Even more complicated if they've been vaccinated before. And if you can get these slides and maybe just print this out, this is how I remember it. Um, and, and this is the, the diagram that I put together. If they've had one dose of the Moderna, they end up, you want to try to stay with the Moderna and get them to three doses, so you give them two more. If they've had two of the Moderna, you want to get them to three, give them one more. Same thing with Pfizer. The idea that CDC wants you to try and stick with the same mRNA vaccine. If they've had at least three doses or they got Novavax or Janssen, Janssen is no longer available in the U.S. since May of 2023, they get one dose. So this is, this is conceptually a little bit harder, but basically think about, you're basically trying to get them to three doses with the one exception if they've had Novavax before, which is not really what you're gonna see very often. Okay, now, and then for these, these are the, the dosing spacing on this. And, and again, if you, if you have these slides, these, are, these diagrams I think might be an easier way to remember it uh, than a lot of very complicated tables. The last question is, What's happening in the U.S. right now? What's circulating? These are November data, late November. The EG5 and HV1 strain are the dominant strain in the U.S. right now, which are obviously not the XBB 1.5 strain. David Ho, who is a pioneer in the field of HIV, his group at Aaron Diamond in Columbia just last week published or, or online put together some information that indicates ser immune, correlates of immune responses to these strains are very good. So it looks like the current vaccine, the XBB 1.5 vaccine, should provide very good responses to these vaccines, according to this not yet published but online data from David Ho's group. It's a very good group at Aaron Diamond. Okay, let me wrap up with MPOX. So the CDC has now really put out a formal advisory about a month ago saying we really need to routinely be giving MPOX to the people that need it. So who, who needs MPOX? You know, this is the formal criteria, but we all know from our clinics that people with HIV in general, a lot of people in our clinics are gonna be good candidates for MPOX vaccine. So new diagnosis of at least an STI, one or more sex partners, and so on. Th these are all, I think, very self-evident as we know who these individuals are that, that really are at risk to acquire MPOX. So there's two different MPOX vaccines. There's the Genios, and then there's the ACAM 2000. I just want to make sure there's no confusion about that. The Genios is safe for people with HIV. It is a live vaccine, but it's attenuated, non-replicating. The ACAM 2000 is a replicating virus that is not safe to give to people with HIV. It is formally contraindicated. So what's the vaccine schedule with MPOX? It's to wait basically four weeks after the first dose and give the second one. Now the question sometimes comes up, what if you have a vaccine shortage, what can you do? You can actually give this as a intradermal vaccine and use one-fifth the amount, so you essentially get five times the amount of vaccine with the intradermal dosing. So it's a really nice thing to know if you ever have a shortage of the MPOX vaccine, go to intradermal doses. 
So the last couple slides, and just I want to have this one last question. A 27-year-old receives this dose of Genio's vaccine, returns to the clinic exactly three weeks later to get his second dose. What should you do? Give the second dose now or have him come back and receive the second dose in a week? What do you think? Okay. All right, so actually, so there's, there's a practical issue. The correct answer is actually B. And let me go over what the CDC recommendations are on this. I would also say that if a person, there was no chance of them following up, you would give that vaccine. But if it is somebody who can follow up, this is what the recommendations are. And I'm telling you this more from a scheduling standpoint to, to emphasize that the CDC recommends it should not be more than four days early. But I also want to put this in the caveat that we all know it's all about getting what you can at the time a person engages in care. So the technical correct answer is uh, to go ahead and have the person come back. But if you had to give it, more importantly, we want to be educating our people to wait one month before they come back. That's the take home point. It's always fine to give it late. Um, you, you don't, the longer you wait, the, the longer it is before they're protected. So the in terms of the immunity with the Genios vaccine, the peak immunity is about two weeks after this vaccine is about, you know, after one dose, reasonably effective, after two doses, more in the 70 to 80 percent range. So the very last thing to end up is just, I just want to also make sure everybody knows about a couple of these are in the handouts. The CDC ACIP constantly updates their vaccine recommendations. Now in the OI guidelines, they have a vaccine section, which is great, and it's really, they're doing a great job of keeping that up to date. And the last thing is on our curriculum site, we really try to keep up with all of these recommendations and keep them up to date. So with that, I'll stop and take some questions and answers. Thank you very much. Well done, well done, Dave. Um, I'll just start with a quick question. You know, we're obviously talking about our patients, uh, what about healthcare workers in meningococcal vaccine? Is it recommended that everyone get that? And if you do, get it, get it every five years? And what if you're over the age of 55? And <sighs> I've gone cross-eyed. Yeah, so meningococcal vaccine is not routinely recommended for healthcare workers. It is not? It is not. Okay. Not to the best of my knowledge. If somebody else in the room knows differently, but I've never seen any recommendation for healthcare hmm. workers. Okay. Following along those lines, I've always struggled with meningococcal vaccine in older patients, and we have a lot of older yes. patients that present, and you know, there's the caveat of not approved after 55, yep. and the, yeah, if you're a health risk, or if you're a high risk, like a lab worker, you should. And some of these people have already received a couple of vaccines. Yep. What do we do? Great question. So uh, the way I would answer that is to say that the current OI guidelines and in that they don't put any restrictions on people with HIV after age 55. So we can continue to give it. I would also say from a common sense standpoint, looking at someone's risk of meningococcal disease, the greatest number of cases have typically been in younger individuals and in more outbreak settings. So I think you could also make a very good argument weighing the risk benefit ratio, somebody who's older than 55, where they probably have minimal risk at that point, that it's not, as, not nearly as important as the younger individuals. Thank you very much. That was an, an excellent presentation. So we're kind of living in a good, a really exciting era in terms of vaccines right now with the, the RSV being one example of that. Do you, there are currently no recommendations for giving the RSV vaccine to anybody under 60, and I'm just wondering if you know if any studies are underway looking at people that have needs for it, people with pulmonary disease, immunocompromised, under the age of 60. Yes, great, thank you. So right now, as for everybody to know, um, there are two RSV vaccines that have been recommended. One is from GSK, one is from Pfizer. They are slightly different. One of the vaccines is a single antigen or has one strain, and it has an adjuvant. The other does not have an adjuvant, but actually has two serotypes, an A and a B. It appears they're both kind of, it's a wash. They appear to be equally effective. Right now, for adults who are not pregnant, the recommendation is for people 60 and older. I am sure there are studies ongoing. Um, but I am not aware of any that are like imminently going to be published, and I, I'm not aware of any. I will say, however, this vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, has been looked at in pregnancy and is recommended 
It's a little bit of a confusing recommendation, but it's recommended for women who are, I think it's week 30, or, or pregnant people, 32 to 36 weeks during their pregnancy, if their child is going to essentially be in that six month window of, of age during RSV season. So it's a little bit confusing because technically the CDC website says, well, we should give it between August or between September and January, but you can make a really good argument if you're following this, you may even want to give it to somebody in July because their young child may be right in the middle of RSV season when they're three months old. But anyway, that is currently, so pregnant people, 32, I think it's 32, 36 weeks, and I, I, I'm not prescribing to a lot of pregnant people, or not to pregnant people, period, really. Um, that, is the, that is the younger age group, and it appears to be very safe in that age group. And I imagine what you're saying will be the next wave of investigate or studies where they'll look at people with underlying health conditions like asthma, cardiac disease, and that that will probably be the next wave of studies. Typically, help. I don't know if you yeah. agree. I think that's what's going to happen. I do. I do. I Not been studying in HIV, I should say, and no recommendations to use RSV vaccine and HIV yet in any recommendation anywhere. Hi, great talk. Thank you so much. I had a question about the conjugate vaccines, the mening meningococcal vaccines. If an individual has not been vaccinated against tetanus or you know, t received vaccination against diphtheria and they don't, you know, they, would that make them less, the vaccine less immunogenic? So should you vaccinate them for those first before you then give the conjugate vaccine for that antigen recognition? Yeah, and, and are you asking that because of the issue about the tetanus toxoid? So yeah. there, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that those vaccines interfere with response to Tdap or to um, any other, it's a different, it's an inactivated um, toxoid protein that's different to the best of my knowledge. It doesn't interfere with those reactions. Less a question about interactions, but would it be less immunogenic if someone has never seen? Yeah, and that's what I meant. Sorry, I should have clarified that. It doesn't <coughs> appear to interact with the immune response or to in, impede the immune response. So somebody who's an immunologist in the room may actually know more about that than I do, so I apologize if there's some information I'm not aware of on that. So my question was also regarding uh, the meningitis vaccine and immunogenicity, but specifically for pneumococcal vaccines. I know with the PCV13, I want to say it was Minveo, has a precaution to not co-administer them because of reduced pneumococcal vaccine efficacy. Yes. Is that also true for the new pneumococcal vaccines? I don't know the answer to that. I can try. I don't know if anybody in the room knows. I know that that was the case, and I have not seen that anywhere that uh, restrictions for it, but I, I'll... I can double check and uh, if there's a way that we can post that. Is it, if anybody in the room knows the answer has seen that, I have not seen that in anywhere, in any guidelines anywhere, like previously when they made that specific point. But I, I love the question, thank you. I just, I don't, I have not seen that contraindication. If anybody, again, has seen that or knows it. You're saying. Thank you. If I heard that correctly, Minactra was the one that had the warning with it, but not right. So that, that's perfect. Thank you. Minactra, again, is the one that's no longer available in the U.S. since May. Or not since May, but it's been a while. So this is more a little bit on the practical side. Maybe I'm alone here, but I have a lot of patients who it's like pulling teeth to get them to get a vaccine, you know. Um, and so I guess just a tip for someone who's, you know, a new practitioner. and Sure. How's that? That's better. Thank you. Sorry. I hate mics. Um, so, more practical. How do you kind of approach these patients who are just super suspicious of every vaccine under the sun to sort of... So, if I understand... How, how, how do you sort of figure out, like... Because so they're, they're wanting to know, like, what's the most important one? Afraid of like, what's the most likely that I'm going to get meningitis if I'm healthy? Like, yeah. yeah, so the two questions that come up a lot are the vaccine hesitancy, which you're talking about, right? Or are you talking about more, you've got this whole, you know, box of vaccines that you need to give somebody and how do you approach it? Well, it's both. They're, they're hesitant because okay. they haven't, and they haven't gotten any, and so you're trying to, like, convince them, like, okay, how do, like, yes. this one first, because yes. it's most important from, like, a likelihood of you getting this disease standpoint. I, yes. I don't know. That, that actually is a really important, that is one of the things that ends up, we end up discussing in the clinic a lot, and if Steve Johnson is near a microphone and he wants to jump up, I know that in his workshop he specifically talked about how do you prioritize the vaccines, and then the vaccine hesitancy, I can tell you my approach, which I don't necessarily 
this is the right one. But when a person first comes in, they're diagnosed with HIV and they're in the clinic, the first thing I want to do is establish rapport with them. And I'm all about that first visit, getting them on antiretroviral therapy, getting a good response, making sure we have the adequate blood testing we need. I do not push a lot of vaccines the very first visit because I think that Vaccines often sometimes make people feel bad for a couple of days, and I want a person to have a really good experience, build a rapport. So a lot of times that first visit, I'm prioritizing getting them started on antiretroviral therapy. Even though there's no data, I also prefer in my mind, if somebody's been on an integrase-based regimen for eight or 12 weeks, and they come back and they see it, they probably have pretty good suppression of viral load at that point, and, and probably get a little better immune response to the vaccines. So I tend to prioritize the thing that's in season as the highest priority that's the greatest need. So if there's a ton of COVID going on like there was a couple years ago, you know, two years, a year ago, we were prioritizing giving COVID up front, maybe flu if there's a lot of flu going on. But then after that, I think, you know, the pneumococcal vaccine was one of the highest priority that I had. Um, and then hepatitis B, hepatitis A, a little bit lower. Hepatitis A, there's also some recommendations that suggest you may want to wait till their CD4 counts above 200 with hepatitis A. So low CD4 count, I would certainly prior. But but Steve, thank you. Please please comment because I know you talked about this in your workshop. Yeah, yeah. We I mean we just brought a, a set of issues to think about in terms of timing of vaccines. One of course is is to make sure the vaccine isn't contraindicated. So there's a set of live vaccines that you wouldn't give in somebody with low CD4 counts. I think the seasonality is very important for flu, for RSV. Uh, probably for pneumococcal vaccines. So if you're immunizing this fall, probably targeting those, the COVID vaccine uh, is, is important. I also think you think about what diseases are common. You know, if somebody's going to accept three vaccines, do you need to give a tetanus vaccine right now when yeah. we really don't see that disease in, in the U.S.? Uh, is there an outbreak going on? So Mpox vaccine in the midst yeah. of a, yeah. And so I just think there's a series of things to, to kind of negotiate with the patient see what they're able to take. Uh, the good news is they're able to take a lot of vaccines at one time, uh, but I, th I think what happens is over several visits, you can get the vaccines in. Right, so basically what you were saying, that, that you give them a, based on the need or the urgency in the exactly. environment. Exactly. I had a quick question. The patient- hey, Can I just add one quick thing? The one, one quick thing to add is, one of the things I try not to do is to give two vaccines that make people feel really awful at the same time. Like shingles vaccine, I've been really impressed with some people, how they knock them down for a day or two. Giving that and COVID vaccine on the same time, I typically try to idea. avoid those two. Yeah, <laughs> right. So if somebody's a disagreeable kind of person to use distemper shots, does that help? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I honestly, again, going back to kind of my, I really like to get people who are, you know, vaccine hesitant, feeling better in some other way. So they build some kind of trust. And then I just approach it each visit and sort of get their feeling of, you know, what is it? How do you feel about this? Tell me what your, you know, what your objective. The thing that has shocked me is how some people selectively mark out some vaccines they'll never get, like right. flu vaccine or COVID. But sure, yeah, hepatitis B, blah, blah, blah. You know, so that is always, always, if somebody says they don't want a flu shot, don't assume they don't want any vaccines. It's worth asking them about other things that they may right. actually be, say, yeah, a pneumococcal vaccine, that's fine. So I always yeah. do that, I always try to figure out what vaccine someone might get. Okay, our, our last question over here. Sure, sure, thanks. Just Could you just comment on your approach to folks that are core positive, surface antigen negative, that aren't converting, that you've tried to, and also, how often are you checking to see, after you've gotten surface antibody positive, how often are you checking to see that they maintain that? Great. So um, there are no recommendations for long-term monitoring for serologic response. There's some sort of, some experts say every 10 years we should be doing it. Um, if you immunize somebody against hepatitis B, you should check a antibody titer one to two months after completing the series. I actually think that recommendation may change with Heplosav B because there's a step up over four to five months and I would wait at least three months with Heplosav B. The issue about core antibody positive, as Mike said, extremely complicated. But the OI guidelines in terms of the other end of it, not the antiretrovirals, but the immunization end, specifically recommend giving a single antigen, hepatitis B, Indurex B, or Recombivax, checking a titer one to two months after you give them that, quote, kind of a booster, kind of that waning immunity, but you need a titer above 100, not the usual 10, to say that they're protected. That's different with core antibody positive than people who are regular vaccine responders. This is in the guidelines. Above 100, they're good to go. 
less than 100, you start back over and re-immunize them. And again, that doesn't answer the question about, and, and Mike's point, I, I really love that you underscore that point about if you have people on, you know, TAF FTC and you're checking HBDNA, it's essentially, a, you know, you're not going to get anybody that's going to be positive. Exactly. Anyway. So, well, thank you very much, David. Wonderful. Thanks, and here's Mark. a book. Here's a...